started. Um, welcome to the uh, Scientific and Research Software Working Group for April 4th, 2024. Uh, I put a couple questions in, but if anyone has topics they want to bring up, I encourage you to do so. Um, so just go ahead and add those in. Uh, one question I have is if, um, and this is kind of at the beginning, we can start anywhere, but one question I have is if, you know, when it comes to working with the scientists that you work with who develop the software, are there topics that you think would be helpful from a mentoring perspective? So are there things that you would like to see people mentored or scientists that are building the software, researchers who are building the software uh, mentored on that would help them become more familiar with um, practices that improve the sustainability and significance of their software? So I, I feel like that's, um, I don't know, so for, uh, I guess, a few of us on here, uh, Bill and Patty and I, um, that's part of what we're trying to do in the project that we're on, uh -huh. but it's also part of what the, part of what a bunch of other groups do as well. So the, the BSSW, the Better Scientific Software Group, tries to provide a bunch of uh, tools and examples for that. Um, there's the Code Refinery Project from the Nordic countries that does a bunch of asynchronous training events for this. Um, code, what was the code called what? Code Refinery. Refinery. Um, there, there's also, I mean, there's a few other groups as well that are doing similar things. And in some sense, um, one way that I kind of think about this is it's the, is that software carpentry is like the kind of basic training for software development. And then we need kind of an equivalent for project development on top of that. Um, there's also the different incubator programs that kind of do some of this, like, I don't know, um, I, I'm not, com I, I haven't gone through any of these, so I'm not completely sure about how well these work, but like the Apache incubator as an example. Uh, we've in the, in the URSI project, uh, the U.S. Research Software Sustainability Institute, when we were doing planning for that, we planned an incubator activity. Um, but we never got funding for it, so it never happened. But the report for that and the plan kind of talks about some of the things we were looking at, uh, which I can find a link for as well. Yeah, that link. I think that link would be helpful. Is that so? When it, it's um, when it comes to the mentoring that you're trying to do on your project, Dan, what are the are the I, I assume these are resources that you would reference. I don't think we've gotten to that point yet um, okay. to, to be able to answer that. I, I think we're, I mean, so our, what we're thinking about basically is kind of these two different things um, specifically for our project, one being making it easier for projects to join foundations, and then second, um, providing metrics or understanding metrics that projects can use to, to see how sustainable they are, or funders can use to see how sustainable projects are, or projects can use to see where they could improve their sustainability. Um, and so I think the idea about like what what's important for sustainability and how do we teach people to do that is kind of underlying both of those. But we didn't, I don't think we've kind of called it out in the way that you're saying. Well, that's that's a lot of information that I didn't expect. So that's awesome. Uh, I mean, this is also what the, sorry, I mean, I mentioned BSSW, um, I guess, which was that first one, maybe, uh, I'll find the Yeah, link. I tried to. I think it's BSSW.io, maybe. So it's all not more serious, exciting. Yeah. Wow, there you go. Uh, it's also cool. what the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK, the SSI, is basically doing. And so they also have a bunch of training and community stuff around that. Uh, 
And when you talk about the metrics, are there are there metrics that pertain to licensing or or governance or DEI that have surfaced? And in particular, I suppose licensing is one where there exist a lot of chaos metrics. And I'm curious if that's something that the scientific and research folks that you work with take into consideration or think about, or perhaps ought to, but don't yet. Um, so uh, you're actually getting to um, this thing that I was just collecting, I don't know, a month or two ago, but hasn't gone very far, <clears throat> which is uh, that document. With the incubator document? No, the thing I just put in the chat. Excuse so me. one of the downsides of being the person sharing stuff is the chat gets pushed. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so I, know, I, I see it now, yeah. Okay. Um, so under under licensing, um, right, I, I mean, basically I was just trying to collect stuff. So so there's the, the GitHub thing, the open seed primer, um, the CNCF recommendations. I, I, I'm not completely sure that that one's as relevant, but because this is a, a intended to be a community document, if somebody suggests something and it didn't seem completely out of line, I just accepted it. <laughs> so oh, that's the, interesting. The, yeah. the end of this was just to, was to collect stuff that would be helpful for projects. And in this case, helpful for projects that wanted to join a foundation and the foundation required them to have a license or a governance document or something else. And, and they don't have one, so they needed to figure out what do they need. So I wanted to kind of collect documents about them and examples. Um, and potentially there could be training as well, but we I actually don't think I have any training in here. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, and I think um certainly what you have what's what's in this link, I think would constitute some. I don't know if I don't know if I'd call, do you call it mentoring? I mean, it's certainly a very useful uh, set of resources that can be a useful guide for folks. Yeah, I, I don't think I would call this mentoring by any no. means. So, um, and in some ways, I f I guess I feel like the like the incubator activities sometimes mentoring is something that comes out of them as a follow on, or maybe it gets built within them, but. Um, I, I don't I don't think I know of anybody that has thought of mentoring in this area or at least is doing mentoring in this area. So the this these links provide some very useful basic information about licenses that are useful though. Um, and, and again, I guess just for anybody here, you know, I mean, this is a this is intended to be a community thing. So if you if you know of stuff that's not in here, please put in a pull request or an issue, or just let me know. Um, it does also. Have a bunch about governance, which is the next sub bullet you had. Uh, it doesn't do anything about DEI except for code of conduct or codes of conduct, um, but there's nothing like, a, I guess, in some ways, you could think of codes of conduct as being, I don't know, uh, uh, more like rules rather than. Uh, rather than encouraging. Well, that's not exactly, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm not sure I can say that right, but it's, but somehow like there's a bunch of stuff that I can imagine for DEI that's much more active than codes of conduct and, and none of that's in here. Oh yeah, there's a codes of conduct link I see. Yeah, I would agree that it doesn't really constitute a mentoring program, yet this is the 
first place I've seen this kind of information consolidated for scientists to use and consider. So thank you, Dan. Yeah, well, if you, if you go up to the uh, slightly further up to the top where it has the general guidance part of it, um, mm -hmm. right? I mean, a bunch of the stuff in there is in some senses, other people that are consolidating some aspects of it, or maybe their versions of all the aspects. But it's, I guess, the thing that maybe is a little bit different is that each of those is some some communities' uh, decision on what's right. And I was trying not to not to say what's right. Right, just providing a list of resources and let people choose what's right for them. Looks like Addy has some things as well. Yeah, uh, right. In, yeah, intersect is another um, is another kind of code refinery like activity. Um, yeah, I think it's still ongoing, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm a, I think I'm one of the advisors of it or on their advisory board or something like that. Because um, I know a bunch of my people have contributed to this and they do have some mentoring like activity because some of my people went to some sort of like a code camp or mentoring camp last year where they gave tutorials. So it was a little bit more um, hands on than resources on their website. That's the intersect training. Uh, yes. Okay. Was it, would you call it training or mentoring or? Uh, I, I think the project is broader. They definitely do have emphasis on collecting resources as well. But I think as part of that, they have events, which which I think they call the boot camp, which I thought was closer to mentoring. Okay, I, I guess I was thinking the boot camp was more training, but um, but I don't, I don't know. I haven't gone through it, so I'm not sure. Elizabeth, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, with regard to the code of conduct specifically, uh, we in chaos went through a few of us went through this, um, I put it in the minutes, the otter technology code of conduct, it's for enforcing and um, it was great and it wasn't just for like open source projects, there were people from all over in that training so um, it was super interesting and very, very helpful. So just going to throw that out that's what we used in chaos. Right. There's, um, I mean, there is also the uh, uh, num focus is going through a uh, code of conduct activity as well, of kind of, in some sense, setting up what could be a default code of conduct for projects in num focus that don't have one, as well as something that projects wouldn't need to use, but they would need to use something that would include some of the same areas. I think, I think John is on. Maybe he can, he might know, be able to say this better than I am. Or maybe not. It was actually me who was uh, leading this initiative. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yes. Sorry, Anessa. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yes, uh, Nafogus has a pretty outdated, the current code of conduct is pretty outdated. So there were conversations for some time to modernize it. And the board of directors who are leading the initiative are pretty close to it. But uh, in the meantime, lots of projects uh, were reaching out to the NumPy mainly staff. I mean, I'm sorry, non-focus staff um, <laughs> about uh, getting help outside of uh, having a good example of code of conduct and getting help meaning how do you mediate, how do you review, how do you mediate conflicts? Because uh, coming up with a good document and right words is the easiest part about code of conduct and with so many projects being small and under resourced in the non-focus community uh, there was a clear need to have a work working group at the level of non-focus that would be volunteer run uh, mm -hmm. to help projects to review to review possible violations. Uh, and it, we are modeling, to some degree, we are modeling a working group uh, for, for the PSF. But the PSF is serving the entire Python community, including events, so they can get overwhelmed. And also, they might not have enough experience to work with 
people in academia. So for, for those reasons, we decided that NumFocus deserves their own CRC working group. And this is where we are now. We are drafting a charter and we are going to start regular meetings in the, I would say two, three months, hopefully. Um, yes, and the, to collect, to, uh, to understand better the, the sentiment of the community, we run a survey. I'm not, I, I don't think it's available to the public. It's available to project leaders who are part of the non-focus community. But it was a survey. How do you feel about the current code of conduct? How do you feel about the proposed draft? Please submit your comments. And we had a link to the document on Google Drive where everyone was welcome to submit their comments, share their thoughts. And we also proposed two models where one was pretty like, more like an, an advisory body uh, a model for the working group another one would be where a, a not working group would be in enforcement body because we had a lot of requests for both so essentially this was our way to vote our referendum like what the projects want and it was it's still unclear to be honest i i would say there is a slight preference towards uh, uh, non focus working group, so you see working group to be an advisory body, and then the project the govern the project uh, leadership can uh, decide what they're going to do with the advice. And also, there are some sort of logistics for the non focus working group not to enforce, like uh, removing commit rights and uh, removing from public spaces and so on. But it seemed like at the last meeting, which we had last uh, week, uh, everyone felt comfortable, and those who were pushing for more, uh, for more leadership from the non-focus working group, they understand that this is not the case for everyone, and therefore we we need to come up with a model that serves best for for the non-focus community. I would imagine that with different, I would imagine you have different maintain. It's such a large community that different, I would expect different maintainers have different hopes and dreams for what this might be. Exactly. Yes. And I would like to second the order, uh, order training, auto tech training. I went through it uh, not that long ago and uh, really, really enjoyed it. It was very helpful. Yeah, I, I haven't gone through it, but USRC chose that as uh, when it switched its code of conduct recently as well. And the people that have gone through it also were very supportive. Is RSE research, it's just the research software engineer is all that means, right, Dan? Yeah, uh, US Research Software Engineer Association is the long version of USRC. I don't know, somebody can rewrite that uh, overly parentheses way that I put that in there. Wow, this is a ton. That is, there's um, obviously many of you have thought about this already. So I'm, I'm glad I asked this question here. Um, any other resources that you think might be helpful if you developed a, a mentoring program for scientific builders and maintainers of scientific software or research software? And this seems to cover a pretty wide, a wide range. I think there is, at this point, there are very few gaps in resources is doing the work, implementing it. That's the hardest part. When you're thinking of mentoring people, and sorry before, Dan, I couldn't figure out how to unmute, but I totally would have just told you to talk to Anissa. Uh, <laughs> But um, when we're talking about mentorship, um, are we talking about like established uh, careers already? Or are we talking like PhD candidates and 
uh, people who are doing the work? I think the way that I was thinking about this, which again, may be coming out of the kind of that incubator planning work is, um, is basically people who are leading successful projects, being able to talk to people that are trying to make their projects successful or trying to design a successful project or trying to build one. And they have questions like, how do I do this? And somebody can say, well, you should think about these things. So they may not give them the answer, but they could tell them, right, here's some resources, here's some stuff, come back to me with some more questions. Gotcha. Okay. So the mentorship programs I'm familiar with are more about upskilling and uh, like the, it sounds like an incubation program, like you're describing, like it would be a three to six months mentorship and then they do stuff. But I do like that approach of just like having, um, it's essentially a RSE on call and anyone who wants input on how to do something, how to enter the space can just interact there. But I don't know if I'd call that mentorship necessarily. I guess the reason I was thinking of it as mentorship is that it would it wouldn't be a I I want to do this one thing. It would be more of a general discussion with somebody that um, again is I don't know is is interested in trying to figure out how to make their project sustainable from talking to somebody that has already done this. Um, so it's kind of skills, but it's also just advice and yeah and practices and. And what I guess what I would call mentoring, but um, would it be like the same person? Would it you would there be matching with a mentor and a mentee, and then that those people are continuously the ones that communicate, or would the uh, person wanting to learn float among people who are just like there to give advice? So I, I think you could do it either way. Um, I. In, in some sense, it's a, it's mentoring. In the other sense, it's it's a cohort. Um, where people Oops. learn from each other. So, and I don't know which is better. Yeah. It would be interesting. I mean, I, I think with the incubator idea, there's if you're doing it as an incubator, then you're kind of developing a cohort. But if you have people that have gone through an incubator and they're willing to mentor people that are in the next round, then that's the other kind of the other way around. Yep. This is uh this is something we've been talking about at Num Focus, actually trying to how to build a mentorship program that sounds very similar to what you're talking about, Dan. Um, and there's uh I'll be on a panel on it at in Seattle, which is very exciting. I know you won't be there, but <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's there's a lot of potential there. Is that the is that the S3C meeting or something like that, or is that a different one? The open source summit. Is that three C? No, no, it's a different thing. Okay. That's the the you're talking about the Linux Foundation thing, Jonathan. I think there, to Dan's point, I think there's another meeting in Seattle that actually Greg will be at. I yeah. Don't if, I don't know if Greg's on the call here today, but uh, at the same no. time? No, I think it's the week before. If it's the week before, it's it's not the same week, but it's very nearby. I can't see the like the week before or the week after if memory serves, which you know, 0. 0.6 probability of that. <laughs> That's too bad though. Yeah. <laughs> I see some folks um adding some additional things around them focus. <clears throat> Yes, I just uh, wanted to clarify that the survey has been, uh, it ran it ran in fall 2023, and we have already produced survey results report. We reported on it, uh, presented on it in the past months at two meetings, and this is the outcome, that the model that we selected would be um, that uh, if a project decides to partner with the COC working group, then uh, the potential violation reports would be reviewed under non focus new non focus code of conduct. Uh, committee, but, uh, under the committee as opposed to project leaders. Yeah, so we, we, have, we have a few challenges because the projects that are part of non focus they do not automatically adopt the non focus COC. Very often, as a matter of fact, 
according to the survey, only 5% of the projects adopted the non-focus code of conduct policy. So if they come for help, for advice to the non-focus code of conduct working group, then the question is, are we reviewing the violation, potential violation, violation under the project's CRC or non-focus CRC? Oh. And, and knowing a little about law, uh, and, huh. and so on. We, we decided that it would be best if we ask volunteers that are serving on the CRC working group to review the potential violation under the non-focus policy. And projects have to agree to it to, in order to establish partnership. Very often, they, there is a huge, there is an overlap, like, you know, CRC, uh, usually uh, have the same goals. Yeah, mm. it's like more in my opinion. In my observation, it's more about details, like how detailed the policy is, and how you can extrapolate uh, on what is not documented in the policy. Yes, so that's that was one of the decisions we had to make because some. Well, they were various opinions, but that's the model that we felt most comfortable with because, you know, it's also a pretty noticeable burden for for the volunteers on the CRC working group. It's not exactly an easy work. No, it's never, if someone files a code of conduct violation, it's never fun for the folks who are on that committee. Dan, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I, I was going to say something um, kind of unrelated to the code of conduct part, so that's why I wasn't. Uh, I was just waiting okay. until it was a good time. I have yeah. just and I, just to kind of maybe also give you perspective is that like through this survey, the way Namfocus serves over one hundred fifty projects, and through this survey, we had less than five violation reports in total for the entire community. So it's like good news. We have very few incidents, but also that means that people who are assigned to do it don't have an opportunity to practice those mediation negotiation skills. Is it the case that, just to want to understand the rollout, it, are projects required to use the NumFocus code of conduct policy and committee, or are they still, do they still sort of have the soft option to do it themselves? How is it um, being rolled out? It's uh, it's up to the project's leadership. Uh, the reason we decided to take to create the working group because many projects, smaller projects, reached out to NumFocus for help, and we have quite a few projects that have like, three to seven members. But it doesn't mean that interpersonal tensions do not happen. No, if there's more than one person, there's a good possibility of uh, interpersonal tensions. If there's even one person. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the state of their mental health, I suppose. <laughs> so so this is uh, this is uh, absolutely optional for non-focused projects, but if they need help, they can reach out to the non-focused CRC working group and they need to agree that the potential violation will be reviewed under the non-focus code of conduct. Okay. It's almost like, you know, let's say, if you, event, you attended the conference and the conference has their own, hopefully, a code of conduct, but then there is a violation and you call the police. So police will not be reviewing the incident <laughs> under the conference's CRC. They will be reviewing under the laws in the state. This that's, is yeah, that's fair. All right. Well, yeah, it sounds like a pretty thoughtful rollout model. Um, we tried. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts about this before we uh, go on to Dan's? I think this might be a good transition to something else because it ties COC. So, Nessa, you brought up like projects needed. They were asking specifically for this. Um, 
it's and we're, we find that they ask for other things too which might like all be part of a mentorship program might some might not fit really there but code of conduct is one governance is one community growth is one um developer engagement so these are aspects that people entering the space for the first time might look to uh, get some advice on like how do we grow our community how do we take our project from an academic institution into the open source world and actually get developers to help, you know, help maintain and build this thing. I hope I noted that right, Jonathan, but uh, I took some notes around, around your comment there. So, so the COC, you know, we've kind of drilled in on the COC for numb focus, but I think your point is that many of the other topics that might be covered under things like licensing or government. And we didn't even talk about community growth or developer engagement directly, but certainly these are concerns for a number of uh, open source research and scientific projects. So that makes sense. Uh, Dan, you can switch topics for us now. Okay. Um, so I was, uh, I wanted to bring up um, Chan Zuckerberg and their essential open source or so open source software project, uh, EOSS, um, and specifically for two reasons. Uh, one is that this journal article that I just put into chat um, that they were involved in um, writing along with Sloan, and I think it was them and Sloan basically that wrote this, um, has 10 rules for funders and rules two and eight. Um, are rules about projects and specifically that they incorporate DEI and that they have open and transparent uh, governance and roadmaps. And so the reason I guess that I'm saying this is that um, Dario has given a couple of nice talks about the projects that have been submitted to them and the projects that they funded looking at what's common about those projects. And so like one of the things is that of the projects that's been submitted, I don't know, some, some percentage, I'm just making up a number here, let's say 30% have code of conducts. And of the projects that they've awarded, 80% uh, have code of conducts. And so there's like some characteristics that they can pull out of that that say, if you want to be funded by them, here are the things that you need to do. Um, and so I, I don't actually have access to those slides. I was trying to find Dario's talk, which I can't find, um, but, uh, but there have been some nice talks on this, and and I think that their kind of their peer review process and their decision process maybe helps us with some of the characteristics that are that at least from a funder that a funder thinks are useful, and that some of the community thinks are useful. And I don't think that there would be anything. Um, I mean, none of them are going to be surprising to anybody here, but it's it's kind of just evidence in some sense. I mean, this makes sense. If you're seeking funding from an organization, it uh, it certainly sounds like a good model for that organization to um, scaffold some of your success and provide this sort of guidance. I think you have more influence to move the ball if you're offering people money. Right. Um, and if we, and I don't know, we could potentially... Uh ask Dario to come on a, a, come to a future meeting and talk about what they've done if you're interested, although it's uh, 7 a.m. West Coast, so I don't know if that would be good or bad for him, but maybe. I'm not sure either. I've, I've worked with Dario for years. I uh, recall most of my conversations being late morning, early afternoon, my time. <laughs> but I think it's worth asking because he has, Dario certainly has a very wide and deep knowledge of this not only from czi but from his work in wikimedia he's certainly he certainly managed a lot of different large groups of open work contributors over the years right i mean i think the other the other part is that that's um czi at this point is the only uh i would say is the only uh philanthropic organization that's doing kind of large-scale support of uh, maintenance for open source in the scientific area. 
where, where they're used to, like Sloan and Moore used to do this as well, but they've kind of, they're not doing it as much or at the same scale anymore. And, and then there's clearly other funders that are doing things focused on open source, but not necessarily in the science part. So then, anyhow, so I don't, it might be interesting. That's, yeah, I'll, I'll invite, I'm going to, I'll reach out to Dario and invite him unless you want to, Dan. No, feel free. That's fine. But it, it's a good suggestion. I think he would bring a, a, a new perspective, to, uh, certainly a, a nice perspective to this group. Um, um, I guess the other part is that uh, part of the reason I was thinking about this is that their um, is that their next meeting is going to be in uh, I think June or July in uh, Boston, and so I, I I don't know if anybody else besides me is going to be there, but um, but sometimes their meetings have some kind of uh, breakouts and discussion area and discussion, so this we could potentially try to to do something related to part of what this group is doing as well. If there's other people there. Yeah, Matt and I have done a good deal of work with the EOS program over the years, but um, not as not as much today as perhaps in the past. Uh, mostly because we're spread too thin. So, um, Jonathan, um, I know you have a a project that uh, to talk about called Moss, and I didn't throw an agenda item on there for that, but I think maybe if we could use the time left to have you. Share share your work with us. You're muted in case you're. Uh... I don't know why I can't find this mute button. Um, what it's a little secret? <laughs> in in what context? Happy to share anything about it. Um, but do we? I have want... no context because no. I don't know. Anessa, maybe you can tee it happy up for to us. Provide. Yes, I have been to, happy to provide it. At, last, uh, at the last meeting two weeks ago, we discussed how the, the open source as, as a whole and also ecosystems within open source are interconnected and how we can identify these connections. And then uh, Dan mentioned MOSS, the project that John is working on. So... We decided to invite you, John, to this meeting to tell us more about it. Like how uh, some questions we had: how you collect data, how how far you've gone, like what what findings you're comfortable to share. Yeah, so I'm loading it up right now. It's gonna take me a second. Do um, you want the Do you want a screen share, Jonathan? Will that help or no? Yeah, that would absolutely help. Show you what okay. this thing. Um, so I can answer that first question of how we collect data. It's manual uh, <laughs> and it's a lot, um, but we, we've we scraped GitHub for contributors to open uh, source software. And that's the only like automatic stuff. And then of course we're using uh, uh, AI to give us some guidance, but this is very much an early proof of concept. So we're not very concerned about um, absolute accuracy with the data. It's more about showing what you were saying, the, the starting to show what's possible when we start um, making these relationships accessible to people. There we go. So if I share this. Good. Well, I feel like I'm looking at an MRI, but I know I'm not. <laughs> it's actually not the first time I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> so this is um, Moss with everything turned on. And this is not really how it's meant to be viewed, but it does look really cool. Like you kind of got like an eyeball. This is one project. This is Bioconductor. And the these are all dependencies to Bioconductor. And like you see it connecting out the Oort cloud of just like sort of disconnected projects, at least according to what we've mapped so far. An Oort cloud, huh? Yes. There's so many wonderful visual metaphors that can be uh -huh. these types of visualizations. Uh -huh. um, but the the general concept of this is that it's supposed to be a, a composable um, map that's dependent, that renders based on what the user wants to do when they load the map. So it's very, you can think about it like Google Maps. Um, in the beginning, in the early days, there were paper maps, which were a very static thing. 
you pulled it out and you had to trace your route by hand along this thing. And God forbid there was like a redirect or one of the roads had changed since you got the paper map. And then after that, there was map quests where you could kind of, it would highlight the road for you, the path, that relationship you're looking for. Uh, but it was still fairly static um, and it would only do mapping from point A to point B to point C, et cetera. And then we get Google Maps where there's a lot of different layers you can toggle. And while Google Maps is like built to get you directions from point A to point B, because of all the different layers, you can use it in a lot of different ways. I've used it to survey my yard to build a fence. I just turned on the satellite thing and put on the little ruler and measured my yard so I'd see how much fencing I need. Uh, you can survey land. There's a lot of different stuff. You can uh, explore topology. People make games out of it uh, just because there's different layers that a user can toggle when they want. So that's the idea here is like the uh, world we're mapping is open source, well, is digital knowledge and research. So the digital knowledge and research ecosystems. So open source projects, uh, organizations associated to those projects, whether that's funding, incubating, uh, or or whatever, sustaining um, academic institutions, the people that build those projects. So all these green nodes down here are people, uh, the dependencies and other types of relationships between, uh, between all these things. Um, also, we want to, we're, we're mapping papers, data sets. Uh, so one of the questions on the notes has to do with uh, getting software cited, I think, um, which is super important. So we, it, when the software is cited, we can uh, put that on the map and then a funder can come in and be like, hey, I funded Matplotlib with a grant of $100,000. What was the outcome of this? And in the end state of the map, uh, as we envision it, uh, the organization would be able to see what uh, papers cite Matplotlib basically after their funding goes into it. And if that's their definition of impact, mm -hmm. it's number of papers that cite a piece of software, then they've now determined what their impact is. But maybe their definition of impact is like how many other projects are dependent on that core piece of software. So the user would shift the map to represent that definition of impact, and they'd be able to see after their funding how many core projects uh, were dependent on, became dependent on Matplotlib. And that time element is something we can play with as well. Like it doesn't need to be after their funding. It could just be in general. Like if I'm sustaining Matplotlib, what other projects in the ecosystem am I sustaining? And at the same time, maybe uh, there's like 10,000 projects that all do something very, very similar. Uh, I, and a funder might want to come in and say, hey, can we consolidate this like visualization little sub ecosystem uh, PyViz is an example of this, and maybe have three or four projects instead of so many uh, that spread the ecosystem a little too thin, and many of which are just kind of professorware or vaporware or, or phantomware at this point. Professorware, um, I haven't heard that, but I like it. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's it's a big problem, actually. So a lot of uh, open source research software gets developed for a very specific purpose in, in institution by a professor or their students, and then just abandoned once the student leaves the institution. Uh, to go on with their career. Um, do you um, reference anything? Like, do you just look at paper citations or do you use, uh, like James Howison has developed, a, I think it's a cite as, as is his tool, I think, uh, where first, you can put a certain amount of code, you can put some code on your GitHub repository have, and uh, make it make your software more easily cited. Uh, so the way we do it right now, so again, this is just proof of concept. This is using a platform called Kumu, which has uh, extreme limits that we've already hit. <laughs> uh, so we're just using Zenodo and the software that has a DOI. We can find the papers that cite uh, that software and put it in. In the end state, yes, I think there's got to be a dozen ways to cite software and scrape it and get all that data. Um, but yeah, this is, this is very, very early in the development process. We're just starting to explore how to get this off of this proof of concept platform and into a standalone. And we have a couple volunteer developers working on it. There's a uh, question from Addy in chat um, uh, about uh, whether it's just num focused projects that you're looking at right now. Let me is largely, so I'm gonna untoggle people here uh, because there's so many people from when we scraped uh, GitHub that it really slows down the map. So I'm going to untoggle it so I can show you some of the stuff that's going on in here. Um, 
There we go. And I'll just I'll just note that we are technically at time, but um, if I'm certainly curious to let you share a little bit more, and so I'll hang out, but you all don't have to if you're not curious. Then to very quickly answer your question about mm -hmm. non-focus ecosystem, it largely we started it by mapping the non-focus ecosystem because that's what we know. But we have started mapping other organizations. Uh, we mapped a little bit of CZI. Uh, we mapped an organization called the AI Alliance. Uh, we're mapping a uh, some fringe technology ecosystems. Uh, and there's one other we just started mapping, um, a project called DRIPS, which does drip funding uh, through dependency graphs, which is pretty neat. Uh, but it, for now, like this big pink slot orb, pink, pink node is mm -hmm. uh, focus. Is that a person? The pink, the pink one is a organization. The orb is. Okay. Very cool, Jonathan. I, I was wondering, um, how did you find papers? Did you were you looking for repos to mention that the repo is linked to a paper? Uh, so some, uh, we did this step a while ago and it was a pain, it was too high. but some software will say in their readme, like we have a DOI or please cite as, and mm -hmm. then we find the DOI of that software, search for it on Zenodo. And then Zenodo will have a section that's like this DOI is cited by blah, 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 blah. And, uh, so we'll just take some of those papers and bring it in manually. I see, I see. The reason I was asking is that I have looked a little bit into this problem some too, because um, my advisor works in similar things. We ran into this thing called papers with code. Have you heard about that? Yes, I have. So I was kind of wondering, because they have, uh, uh, they're doing a lot of this kinds of things, although I think they're doing different kinds of NLP techniques, but very, very focused on the machine learning ecosystem only. So I was wondering if you know there were some similarities in your approaches and their approaches. I am not very familiar with how they do what they do, uh, but I will. Um, oh, there's so many options. I forgot how to map a lot of this stuff. So go to organization to domain. These are all essentially the layers that you can turn on. Um, these are, are these basically edges where you're showing the linkage, the links are the the between people and projects or people and packages. You can turn those links on and off. Yep. Okay. And these are the ones we've we've come up with so far. Uh, and there's, there's more that we want to do, but you know, it's basically me building this thing. <laughs> Limited time. Um, so with papers with code, the relationship we would have to them is we've mapped the AI space fairly, um, not extensively, but it's one of the more in-depth ones we've mapped, one of the areas we've mapped more in-depthly. Oh my gosh, let me move this thing. So a lot of this is, like Kumu is built for a couple hundred nodes hmm. and we're well over tens of thousands. So it does not yeah. like. It's not playing well with the scale of data. No. So I don't think we have them on here. Um, no. From a from a mapping ecosystems perspective, I'm I'm certainly curious about what you're doing here, and I would I, I personally would love to have a a deeper conversation with you because you know determining how to map nodes and what to map and what's useful and what becomes an overwhelming. Uh, or cloud sociogram from hell for people that they can't interpret. Um, these are like, these are things we think about a lot as we think about open source ecosystems, like how to represent it and make it touchable or comprehensible by people. Yes, I think, yeah, those are all discussions that are fun to have and I'd love to have. <laughs> and yeah. with us in particular, with the impact metrics, that's also something that we think about a lot uh, for example, with people, like how do you measure the impact of a person in the open source ecosystem? And one of the easiest ways is what we did, which is like scrape their commits to repos. But that mm -hmm. is very much not the best way to do it. Uh, and then Thanks, the, Dan. the reality we've come it's to. It's my fault for not uh, constraining the meeting, but I'm personally curious. So we can, we can do this a different time. Uh, but just to really quickly finish finish the thought, the, the, the result we've come to is like we need 
thousands of different impact metrics running side by side in plural with one another. Uh, and then the user should be able to toggle among which metrics they want to enforce on the map at any given moment in time. Because what they determine is impactful will change from day to day, maybe from hour to hour, depending on whether or not they argue with themselves on their own open source project. But um, what does the size indicate, Jonathan? Uh, for now, it's hard coded in in degree connections. So when I rendered these sizes, I think it was dependencies, dependency graphing. I see. So matplotlib has a lot of dependencies coming to it, but also SunPy does not have a lot of dependencies to it. So I don't remember at this point. Um, NumFocus does have a lot of projects connected to it. So the, this would indicate that a lot of projects import NumFocus or num, matplotlib? Uh, yes. Okay. Import matplotlib. And then the size of NumFocus. So they were rendered at different times for different uh, demos of what is possible here. So it's kind of um, messy, let's say. Uh, but there are a lot of projects associated with NumFocus. So that's why it's one of the bigger orgs. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't rendered the node size for like the AI Alliance, which is, you know, also has a lot of connections coming into it. Yeah. Largely is the way you do it is through just like, random CSS code that's not fun to play with. So. Yeah. So I think um, if I have to, I should end the meeting, Jonathan, at uh, for yeah. the mercy of people. However, I'm I'm very curious if um, you could, are you in the chaos Slack by chance? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll tag you there and um, in the, and, and just see if we can set up a time to talk more in depth about this, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I absolutely. I would also be very interested, Jonathan, if you're gonna do the uh, detailed discussion to join. Yeah. What I'll. How about if I um make tag Jonathan in a note inside the working group channel on Slack, Addy, and then anyone who's interested can um, express interest, and we can go ahead and coordinate a time if that works. That sounds great. Awesome. I, I I am way over my my coordination skills are terrible today, but my curiosity for what you had to share with us, Jonathan, was high enough that uh, I just threw caution to the wind. So thank you. Well, I appreciate your sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Right, thanks, hey, Jonathan. Sean, before before you drop, uh, can you yeah. look at your Slack and email for a Augur database um, yep. thing? Okay, yeah. awesome. All right. Bye, everybody.